um, on the Q and A box. We are recording this session so that if people can't make it or you want to have a look at anything that was discussed, uh, you can certainly come back to it afterwards and we'll share that with you uh, as soon as we get that link from Zoom in the next couple of days. So without any further ado, let me hand you to each of the participants in turn to just tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, Lisa Lott, if you could just start. So it's just to introduce myself or the topic, just myself, right? Okay. First of all, I'll try to, um, to move very slow. Otherwise, I'll be zoomed and I'll disappear from the screen. My name is Lisa Lingso. I'm a futurist working at Future Navigator in Copenhagen. I've been uh, looking into the future for many years. Back in 96, I actually predicted Brexit. So um, <laughs> I've been working in this field for many years. Thank you. Paul. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, everybody. I'm, my name is Paul Plant. I'm a digital transformation consultant based uh, in the UK, although I spend uh, most of my time on airplanes or used to um, flying around the world. Um, I've known Rohit for well over two decades. We, uh, we were futurists together in the early days of when we tried to take the Yellow Pages business into the digital world and um, anyway that, that would be another book on its own um, but anyway it's a, it's a delight to be a part of this process and I'm very much looking forward to the next couple of hours. Thank you Paul. Sheila. Hello I'm Sheila, Sheila Moorcroft. I'm based in, in London. I was lucky enough to work in Stanford Research Institute as it used to be back in the in the 70s and early 80s and took uh, found my natural home in the first ever horizon scanning program that was uh, was set up and run there and so i've been doing horizon scanning and foresight since about 1980 um so i've seen quite a few changes and quite a few have come true which was uh, which was quite quite gratifying and i too am looking forward to this evening excellent well thank you all uh so let me let me start the session off by telling you a little bit about the uh the book itself and the baseline scenarios we created. Uh, this was this came about, I think it was about March 18th, the team and I were discussing uh, how we were going to deal with the fact that the uh, crisis had literally obliterated uh, every revenue stream we had and uh, our order book had gone from healthily full to uh, unhealthily empty. And we're a publisher as well, so we thought the obvious thing to do was to put together a book uh, with friends from around the world sharing their thoughts on what the world might look like after the pandemic. So we put a call for papers out on the 20th of March, uh, and now nine weeks later, the book has gone to print. Um, we had 115 chapter submissions, and we split the very best of those across two books. So there will be a second book coming out in September, which is more of a deep dive looking at particular countries, particular themes like retirement and education in much more detail. But this first book is a kind of broader view of what are the shifts and scenarios and developments that could shape our world. So let me, let me dive straight in uh, to, to tell you a little bit more about that. It's, as we've already heard from our panel, so you know who's going to be with us today. And, and they're all part of the first section of the book, which is looking at critical shifts and scenarios. Uh, what we know is that anyone trying to look at the future in any period of time will be aware of a number of different forces coming together and that those can play out into multiple possible outcomes. And we like to take the approach of developing scenarios. We're not going to do a scenario exercise right now and teach you about scenario planning, but what we do do is, in the approach we use, which is called the driving force model, you try to identify what you think are the two most impactful forces that are also the most uncertain, and then you look at how they might play out and you weave in all the other forces uh, together. So for us, the two most important ones were the evolution of the pandemic, where we saw this spectrum of poor containment through to eradication, and uh, economic recovery, where you go from a deep and prolonged downturn to the possibility of a vibrant economic rebound in this period. The idea is to choose axes that are not totally dependent upon each other. And whilst, you know, they are obviously related with what we're seeing already in the world is that people are trying to get moving even without the uh, pandemic being addressed completely. So we saw four scenarios coming out and I'll talk about these in a bit more detail. Uh, down in the bottom quadrant was the long goodbye. 
Uh, the one where we eradicate the pandemic but have a, a serious recession is called Safe But Hungry. The top left corner there where the economy rebounds but uh, we haven't contained the pandemic, we call the VIP economy. And then the fourth scenario uh, is one which we're calling inclusive abundance. And I'll come back on those in a few minutes to talk about more detail, them in more detail. What I would say is that we could have gone further. We could have gone to more polar extremes. So there is one that talks about, you know, not just a very deep and prolonged downturn, but an absolute depression, anarchy and all those things. And at the other end, you've kind of got some world leaders talking about a super V recovery with it all coming back before the end of this year. We haven't gone to either of those extremes. We've gone for what we think are plausible, incredible scenarios that people can work with uh, in the book. And we've looked at a number of underlying drivers. By the way, a few people are putting their hands up. We're not going to take questions from people raising their hands. Um, what we will do is take your questions in the Q&A box. So um, not much va value in you raising your hands unless you're doing it for exercise. Uh, just put your questions in the Q&A box. If you have comments, put them in the chat box. We can't guarantee that the panelists will read the, qu the, the chat but we will certainly look at the Q&A. So the first is the shape of the economic recovery. And at one end of the spectrum is this idea of a very sluggish recovery with potentially the US declining by 20% uh, in GDP this year, other economies anywhere between 10 and 30%. Many economies really focusing on their own internal needs rather than collaborating in the way that they did in the, G in the uh, global financial crisis to pull us out. And really the, the sense that it's not until mid to late next year when the power brokers come together to try and do something more sustainable for the whole planet. On the other end of the spectrum is a much uh, stronger rebound where optimism drives the growth of economies. Countries really with their banks drive lending led recovery. There's new job creation. There's an investment in skills and there's a real focus on making sure that even the poorest and weakest of nations are part of that economic recovery story. The next is GDP growth itself. Uh, we would say that at this end of the spectrum, the, the, the kind of less optimistic end of the spectrum, GDP growth falls by about six to eight percent this year. Uh, at best is a flat line next year and then maybe gets to sort of two percent growth by 2022. Other end of the spectrum, uh, the optimistic end, maybe the GDP of the world only declines three percent this year and then sees a bounce back next year of four to six percent, which is replicated in 2022. Uh, in terms of the way the pandemic evolves, then at one end of the spectrum, you know, we see poor control. We see it being relatively out of control in certain countries like the US, Brazil, India, where it just keeps rolling. They have big second and third peaks. And maybe we don't even notice the difference between the peaks in some countries because they just roll into each other. Other countries in Asia and Europe manage to avoid that and have a much smaller second peak. And then you have some countries that are really quite robust all the way through and return to almost normal operation as you're seeing in places like Taiwan and New Zealand and Vietnam right now. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, this idea of global collaboration really meaning that we get the mechanisms in place to get this under control globally by about 2022. What does that mean in terms of viral spread? Well, at the negative end of the spectrum, we could be looking at anywhere between 10 to 20 million infections this year with three to six million deaths. Uh, the more positive end, maybe six to eight million infections and less than a million deaths. Uh, so, you know, quite a big difference there. But uh, uh, the real concern is that a lot of the poorer countries with poor health infrastructure are really yo-yoing in and out of this lockdown situation for a long time because they have very little in the way of health infrastructure to help them control it. And their lockdown measures aren't that effective. In terms of testing and vaccination, then at the negative end of the spectrum, we're looking at potentially only 20% across the globe getting antigen testing this year, less than 10% getting antibody testing. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we're looking at, you know, the optimistic view is that maybe up to 50% get antigen testing this year and you know, 20 to 50% get antibody testing. From a vaccination perspective, in the worst case scenario, we're looking at maybe a, you know, not having a vaccine till 22 at the best, and maybe only 20% being vaccinated globally by the end of that year. The optimistic scenario sees 
uh, vaccination being available from January next year. And if we to believe the pharma companies and a lot of governments, we would have the capacity to create vaccines for at least 50% of the planet. The question is always going to be around the delivery infrastructure. Uh, from a political perspective, and then at the kind of uh, the bleaker end of the spectrum, what we see is countries really focused inwards, very little collaboration. We're already seeing a lot of infighting between countries, domestic unrest, potentially riots and, and um, civil unrest in a lot of countries, several governments falling because of their, their handling of the situation. And it's not for a long time, certainly till the middle of, to end of next year, that countries start to align and realise they have to do something for the weaker and, and, and failing nations. The other end of the spectrum, much more optimistic outlook where, you know, maybe towards the middle or end of this year, we really start to take on a view that this is something that we're in together globally. We have to have a global solution because whilst anyone is suffering from the pandemic, we're all at risk from it. Uh, and a really coordinated effort politically to create a global political solution, but also to put in place better political infrastructure in the countries that have really struggled to respond effectively. Uh, from a business point of view, then, at the less optimistic end of the spectrum, there's this sense that even when lockdowns lift, in a lot of countries, businesses are very nervous. They discover that there isn't much business out there once they do restart. They end up laying off some of the workers who've been furloughed. There's a lot of cutting of budgets for this year because revenues aren't going to be anywhere near what people expect. And that rolls into revenue targets and budgets for next year, all of which has a knock-on effect into supply chains, which helps to dampen global GDP quite dramatically. The other end of the spectrum is a much more optimistic view where you see governments and banks really trying to drive the growth of the economy with a lending-led uh, growth, a real focus on jobs and skill creation, investment in digital literacy, investment of the industries of the future, uh, a Green New Deal type focus to really take us forward. And again, this idea of inclusive uh, focus in business with corporates in particular trying to invest in weaker and developing nations to help move them on with, with new models of business for the future. From a consumer perspective, uh, at the less optimistic end of the spectrum, the expectation here is around maybe a little bounce when lockdowns lift, lockdowns lift, but then people retreating and really focusing on themselves very much, their own savings, their own well-being, saving their money rather than spending because there's such uncertainty and so many people having lost their jobs. At the other end of the spectrum is the hope of a, a feel-good factor where people go out, start spending, new jobs get created quite quickly, new skills are learned and we tackle unemployment at a, a fairly ra rapid pace to, to start turning the cycle round and have a spending-led uh, boom. And you know, you're seeing governments talking about negative interest rates to encourage that. Uh, I'm not saying these are good or bad things, but I'm just talking about the features in our scenario. From a socio-demographic perspective then, at the, the less optimistic end of the spectrum, we see real and, and lasting damage done to society, to mental health, to domestic violence, to crime levels, and a, a sense that people are really focused on themselves and dealing with the issues of unemployment and underemployment. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, this sense that actually the collective uh, arrangements that have started to emerge, the community spirit really lives on. And we've seen it in many countries where communities have self-organized and that carries on through the recovery there's a much stronger focus on dealing with unmet need in society and caring for uh, those who have health conditions, those who have mental health conditions, the, the elderly, those in care, and really starting to make sure that we have a more inclusive and nurturing approach to, to moving society forward. And, and then science and technology. I think in the, in the less optimistic scenario, there's a sense that investment overall might strug struggle here from governments and a lot less focus on you know, what we want to create for the future, but a, a divide. Those with money, whether it's individuals or corporates, are really investing in this period uh, and, and pulling away from the pack, whereas the, those who don't, whether it's individuals, uh, companies or countries, and get left further behind. At the other end of the spectrum, there's this hope that the recovery packages are really science and technology led. Governments tying uh, the bailouts to corporate investment 
in creating new jobs and creating new industries, a real focus on the Green Deal industries and on reskilling society to take up those new jobs. And finally, on the environment, we've seen the environment benefit from air, in terms of air quality, emissions, water quality, because of the, the slowdown in economic activity. But at this end of the spectrum, there's a feeling that that stuff gets put aside in pursuit of economic growth again and just trying to get economies moving so the economy, the environment could really suffer. At the other end of the spectrum uh, is the hope that the environment is really tied to the recovery deals. And we're already seeing it. So in France, the bailout of Air France is tied to Air France really driving down its environmental footprint. And we could see a lot more of that and a lot more investment in green new technologies, a, a real focus on driving down our environmental footprint and consumers expressing a much stronger desire to have greater environmental control. So that, that throws us, at, you know, those are the drivers that feed into these four scenarios and it gives us four. Uh, what we call the long goodbye is really where we start to say goodbye to a lot of the old system structures and hierarchies, countries focusing inwardly, a, a lot of decay of the system and a feeling of living in a system that really can't cope. Um, and it's, as we say, it's not until the end of next year really that we start to move forward in this collective approach to saying, how do we deal with this as a global issue and, and putting investment into the, the, the poorer developing nations. We don't think that's gonna be easy. In this scenario, we see it as actually a collective of uh, the big organizations, the G7, the G20, Shanghai Cooperation, uh, African Union, GCC, U European Union, coming together with billionaire philanthropists, big corporates, and social activists to come up with a new Marshall Plan in, in, in effect. A five-year plan for how we take individual countries forward from a social infrastructure, from a health infrastructure, from an educational infrastructure and a governance perspective and help them create the industries of the future and create more resilience so that they're not dependent on global supply chains as much and have local capability. Uh, we don't think those deals would be bought into that easily by a lot of world leaders in those countries who might put personal um, aggrandizement above the needs of their country, but would come kicking and screaming eventually to these new scenarios. Uh, the second is the safe but hungry scenario where effectively countries accept that particularly when they're facing a second and third wave, that they really just have to accept they've got to bite the bullet on economic development and focus on really eradicating the pandemic and getting the, the the solutions out there, whether it be antigen testing, antibody testing, vaccination and cures, uh, and, and really put a focus on that, but then end up with a more sustainable rebound on the other side. Uh, the third scenario, and this is interesting enough, when we share this, most people think that this is the one we're in now in their country, or the one we're most likely to hit, where we just have a parallel path, where we have the pandemic running and we're trying to do what we can to contain it, but we, we focus on also driving the economic rebound. Uh, and the reason we call this the VIP economy is that what we start to see is social distancing between the middle class and the wealthy and actually trying to put a gap between those who seem most likely uh, to be victims of the coronavirus, living in poorer areas with more cramped conditions, less provision, being separated effectively from the rest of society the, those who are seen as the investors and wealth creators and the people working for those businesses are first in line for each of the different types of testing and vaccination. And what we see here is people, as in every downturn, making a lot of money who have the cash to go and bargain hunt the, the assets of the businesses that fail during this period. And a real exacerbation of the sort of tier, two tier structure that you see in many nations. And then the fourth scenario, this is the, the optimistic one where we do effectively eradicate the pandemic. We have a globally coordinated effort to get testing and vaccination out across the globe to get that investment in uh, economic regeneration across the globe in creating new skills that enable people to go out and find new jobs or create their own jobs that might well see uh, some form of guaranteed basic income while people retrain not necessarily for the whole population, but for an awful lot. Uh, and we start to see mechanisms being put in place to avoid countries being at risk again from whatever the next pandemic or health crisis or environmental crisis might be. And that includes things like building local small footprint manufacturing, 
developing local R&D facilities, developing new forms of agriculture like vertical farming, so that there's a much greater sense of being able to, to navigate through the next crisis. This is by no means the kind of sunlit uplands. Um, there are still a huge number of the challenges as, as identified by the uh, Sustainable Development Goals still there. We, you know, there's still a lot that we haven't made progress on. But over the next two to three years, there's a feeling that we're starting to move in the right direction and we're starting to put a focus on the whole of society. So those are, uh, uh, and, and really, you know, what we're, what we're seeing here is that to move into those, the, those more optimistic scenarios requires us to try and tackle this scenario, not using the old tried and trusted dance routines, but really having to learn new steps, new rhythms, new ways of moving, new partners to dance with, to create new possibilities for the future. So that's my very quick run through of the scenarios. What I'm now going to do is to throw up um, a polling question to see which of those four um, you think is most likely. Let's get the poll up on the screen. Uh, so we've got the four scenarios there, the long goodbye, the VIP economy, safe but hungry, and inclusive abundance. Um, everyone can vote, panelists as, long as well. I'm going to quickly answer a couple of questions uh, for people while you're voting. Um, will we talk about legal? Who knows? If someone votes that question up, then we will. Will the book be available in the US through Amazon? Yes, but Amazon is taking forever um, to accept new books, so we don't know how long it will take. Uh, and sorry about the shipping cost to the US. Um, uh, the other two will see if we can take, um, if they get supported. Right. Uh, another four seconds for you to vote if you haven't already. Uh, that looks like pretty much everyone in polling. Let's share the screen. So, which is the scenario that you think is most likely in your country? Interesting. So, there seems least, least support for the idea of inclusive abundance. Uh, safe but hungry seems the most uh, likely one where we're saying we will accept um, an erosion of the economic outlook in favor of the eradication of the pandemic. And then almost equal numbers saying, no, we're going to go down the VIP economy route and just accept that, uh, like influenza, we're going to have to live with coronavirus as a, an evil in society. And then uh, slightly less, except that expect that we're going to be in that worst case scenario of the four we present. Interesting, interesting uh, sharing of views. So let's, um, let's take some views now from our panelists who've sat here Diligently, it's very, it's very tough for futurists to sit for 30 minutes and not pass comment. So uh, let's take, let's start with you, Sheila. Uh, any reflections on the scenarios? And then you've had the chance of hearing them once before, but. Uh, um, anyway. I, 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 I think, you know, first of all, well done. I mean, getting, getting them done in the time time with everything else that you've been doing is, is quite, quite an undertaking. So uh, well, well, well done for doing it. Um, I, I think, my fear, I, I, the, last, the first time I heard them, I, I thought we were heading in the UK for the, the VIP um, <clears throat> economy, where the economy would, would, uh, would, would be okay, and, 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 but the, the pandemic wouldn't. I've become, I think, more pessimistic, and I've dropped down to, to the, uh, the worst case, the, the, the long goodbye, sadly. Um, what I hope for is is number four is is the abundance and I I I but I look I want the leadership it's the lack of global leadership that I think is is the critical issue I I in the, the previously I've mentioned a few female leaders who've been doing a very good job in New Zealand Kerala New Mexico Angela Merkel in 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 Germany and and they seem to be bringing people with them in a way that many other leaders just haven't been able to do so. And with the attacks that are, are going against China, which is undermining any pass of possibility of global collaboration, and the chaos in, in some of the other economies like Brazil and America, and the attacks again on, on, on WHO in terms uh, on the WHO, 
really do make me very pe pessimistic about um, about the opportunities for for a global abundance um, uh, response. But um, I hope I will be proved wrong, and that my normally I'm optimistic, but at the moment I'm in pessimistic mode. But hopefully I will be proved wrong. Thank you, Sheila. On this occasion, Paul, Paul what about your take? Well, like Sheila, I'm a born optimist, and but my my view has gone exactly the same as hers. You know, because you know we we, we did this poll together uh, a few days ago, and and I was I was in the the VIP uh, optimism category, but I, you know. When you when you watch the news over the last three or four days, you know I I do question you know the ability of, of, of leadership in in some of the more developed countries of the world and you know I'm a firm believer that when when you've got a global problem, you know like we have right now, you have to come up with a global solution for it. Mm. You know and that requires global collaboration. You know and the one thing we're not seeing a huge amount of uh, right now is is a lot of collaborative thoughts you know and people thinking a little bit outside the box and a little bit outside of their own backyards um you know and you know now's not the time to you know to be attacking others now now the time to be you know trying to find the positives in this and find trying to find a collective way uh, of how we're going to work our way out of it you know i mean i work with a lot of small businesses most of my consulting is with with companies who serve a lot of small businesses, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, you've only got to look around your own neighborhoods and you can see local businesses suffering and, and they more than anyone else are looking for guidance and leadership right now. And sadly, I don't see a whole, a whole stack of good stuff uh, coming out from our, from our politicians and our leaders. But, you know, I think that will change. I do, you know, I'm a, as I say, I'm a born optimist and I do honestly believe that that will change, but I think, you know, it's not going to happen quickly, sadly. Yep. Um, Lisa Lott. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Rohit, for your scenarios. I think uh, they, are, they are very good at picking out the uncertainties. And I think it's uh, uncertainty is exactly the key word. We don't know mm -hmm. how this is going to evolve. And I think it's unfair to give one scenario because I actually think due to different nation states acting in different strategies, we will have different scenarios existing in different places around the globe. So it's not going to be one size fit all. To be quite honest, I think China is going to actually cope fairly well because they have their mm. social points, like it or not, and they have a, a nice data scanning over the people. And I think areas like New Zealand is definitely opting for the abundance strategy, uh, like the Scandinavian countries. And then uh, you have areas in the world where people are left to their own devices and going down the drain. And I'm, of course, looking very much into whether the EU is, uh, with the initiative of Macron and, and uh, Merkel, is going to pull it through with this uh, martial aid plan, because that would really be a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, saving uh, an EU that has taken up very, very little room during this pandemic. So... Um, as a futurist, I don't say whether it's good or bad. I just say interesting, exciting. And then um, I'm going to put different points in the four scenarios until we know more. And uh, yeah. I mean, I would say that uh, we went from thinking that, you know, most countries would end up in that VIP economy model of just living with it to, to, to like Sheila and Paul more recently just feeling like actually the economic picture is a little bleaker mm. uh, and that maybe it's not a bad thing actually that if we'd stayed in the VIP economy there might have been a view that it was about returning to the past and just getting the old systems back up and working. I, I think going down into that painful quadrant maybe the upside of the pain is that we do end up letting go of some of the old inefficient models, the old inefficient ways of working. You know, I was watching something today about the kind of innovation that's going on in healthcare delivery and just enabling doctor surgeries to become far more effective, far more efficient, uh, far more responsive to patients by using technology and not having to bring them into surgeries and increase the risk of them catching things uh, from other patients in the waiting room and being able to support them far better. So I, th I think, you know, there will be pain and inevitably will be pain, but hopefully on the other side of it, 
we, we put the focus on investing in the new industries, on reskilling people for those new industries. Uh, and that there is some upside to the pain. There's some pleasure that goes as a result of having taken the pain. Um, I'm gonna, there's a couple of questions coming. I'm gonna pass these around the panel, see who wants to take them. Um, what are the effects on the country who finds the vaccine first locally and internationally? So what happens when people get the vaccine? What does it do to countries? Who wants to take that? Sheila? I think, well, my, my first question is, is whether we're looking at the economic benefits because it depends whether they then share it. I think that the first thing is how will they respond? Will it be that open-handed, we'll share it with the world, um, we're not just going to keep it for our, our purposes or us first and, and then you can go hang yourself. So I think that's the first thing. And I think if they go down the sharing, they will gain a great deal of kudos because it, we, you know, if they, they, they in, require the company or the university or whoever it is who develops it actually to license it so that we really can see a global response to the pandemic and that we can begin to share those benefits. I think that would be a very, very powerful message. And I think whoever does, does that could really come through as a, as a major leader in, in or, or, or gain kudos and, and, and become a, a much more credible leader on, on, on other fronts. So I think that's the, the, the first question. In terms of how people will, will behave, I think it, that, I suppose part of the problem will be how do you, do it? even if you can make a billion um, doses of, of, of the vaccine, that's still only one in six people in the, on, on, on the planet. So how, as someone said, how do you get it there? Vaccines are very um, travel averse. They have to be kept very carefully. So is it automatically going to be well, we're okay, Jack, because we've got mm. health systems that can keep things cool, they can preserve the vaccine, they can deliver it. So we could see a, a, a just because of the logistics of administering a, a, a vaccine on a huge scale, I think we could see huge divisions emerge again or further um, inequalities between countries that have good health systems and countries that have very inadequate health systems. Thank in you. terms of individual behavior once it's out and, and you could see you know people you know the black market could open up so that people are spending very large amounts of money to uh you can tell i'm in a in a in pessimistic mode at the moment um but you, you you could see people spending a lot of money to 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 buy it on the black market but i think you know, people let's um Let's yeah, take some of the other questions. And let somebody else have a yeah, turn. There's a great question from Tari Gal Hussein as well. That was thank you. Um, I'm going to take one now. Uh, before I do that, I'm seeing some people post uh, questions in the chat box. Please, if you've got questions, put them in the Q and A. And the way we're answering them is the ones that get the most votes are the ones that we're picking off the list. Um, secondly, I'm seeing little comments flash up, but they're only coming to the panelists. When you type a comment there's a little drop down menu that says two. And what I would encourage you to do is to choose the option that says to all panelists and attendees or all panelists and participants, which one it is, so that everyone can see these. Cause there's some great comments flashing up, but it, it's only the five of us that, or the four of us that are seeing them. So make sure you type them to everyone. Um, okay, I'm gonna take this one to uh, Lisa Lott uh, because it touches on something you just said. Bronk Hintzman, hi Bronk, uh, from the US has asked, isn't it possible for all scenarios to happen simultaneously in different parts of the world? Uh, yes. The answer is yes, yeah. But do you want to elaborate on that a little bit, uh, Lisa? I just did, but I think I'll do that when I go through my chapter as well. Okay, because fantastic. Very a lot. So then I'm gonna hand uh, another question to uh, Paul and David Wood. And these are all sort of related. Um, in which ways, this is, so David Wood, Chair of London Futurists, in which ways could a more progressive collaborative leadership emerge from local regions, e.g. New Zealand, Kerala, Germany, South Korea, et cetera, and gain global traction? And if I could add a rider to that, uh, what would it take for governments that believe they know best to pay attention to the lessons coming from those countries? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I think, you kind of touched on, and, and maybe this could be the forum 
for it in the future. But I, th I think, you know, when, when you look around the world and, uh, and both Sheila and Lisa Lott touched on it as well, there are definitely pockets of good, you know, in different regions of the world. But what we need is some kind of, um, you know, best practice forum, you know, be it a, a, a Davos or something like that, where people come together and share this best practice and then come up with it, you know, you know, we talked about logistics and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I foresee, you know, like different hubs around different parts of the world where, uh, you know, where vaccines and stuff are produced, where they can get to as many people in as minimum time uh, as possible and that kind of stuff. You know, and I, so, so, I, so I do believe there is, there is a forum to be created if, the, if, if there isn't one uh, in existence already where we can look at where best practice is happening. And, and as I say, we're, you know, we've already had cited plenty of good examples of where, where good practice is happening and then find the best way of deploying that you know, to as many people as quickly uh, as possible. And I think that will be one of the positive things that comes out of this so that some of the mistakes we've made this time around don't get happened, you know, don't happen, you know, when surely the next pandemic, whenever that may be, comes around. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Lisa, you had a very short answer to the last question. So let me give you one where you can perhaps give a slightly bigger answer from Perry Walker. Um, he, he asked, or she asked, uh, in which of these scenarios do you see a basic income becoming a standard policy in many countries? Well, for sure, for sure in the abundance scenario, but there is a difference whether it's a crisis basic income or whether it's a, a permanent basic income. And I think, and maybe that's because I'm living in such a privileged uh, part of the world, but what Corona is bringing on as well is that, yes, you lie on the sofa, yes, you get a minimum income, but yes, you are also bloody miserable because you're not uh, in the game anymore. You are completely pacified. You don't know why you get up in the morning. I mean, uh, I'm sure the reason uh, Ruhit is online now is not because he's poor, but it's because he's poor in terms of uh, getting his ideas out into the world. And that goes for a lot of people. So, so let's not think that it's just a question of, of getting a basic income. It's also about people feeling important to society, that there is a need for them, that they have lifelong learning, that they are important. And we had this during this corona, some people are certain, suddenly indispensable, extremely important, and other people are completely disposable. And that has really uh, put a new dynamic into this discussion, I think, of a basic income. It was just the easy plug-in from the tech companies before. Suddenly, we, we realized there are many more nuances to this question. I, I agree. I think um, it's been very easy for people to challenge the idea of a universal basic income because they say things like, well, why would you give Richard Branson 1,500 euros or 2,000 euros a month? He's a billionaire. Uh, and it's become a very easy way to avoid the issue. I think it, that it's not beyond the wit of humans and their technology to come up with a system that says if you're earning less than a certain amount you automatically get a payment but it is tied to investment in yourself investment in your skills something that enables you to then create for the future I think I think that's the model we'll go for there's a lot of talk at the moment about different countries having a UBI no one does uh, Spain sort of created a guaranteed minimum income talking about some sort of UBI, but no one's gone there yet. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I've, I'm going to end this session now because I'm a stick left of time uh, and we've run out of the time that I've allowed to my own piece of this. Um, so now we're going to move on to Lisa, who's going to share with us from her chapter. And you could tell us uh, more about a laboratory for the future. So if you take a few minutes to talk about the, the contents of the chapter and then we'll dive in with some questions and discussion. I've really been looking forward to this and to discussing with all you guys. And before we even move out on, so try to reach the ceiling because you've been sitting still for a long time, shake your body a little bit, listening to all these scenarios. So I think uh, that's really important in this time where we spend so much time looking into screens that we remember that we have a, a whole body going on here. We have a, a obesity epidemic for at the moment with these corona kilos going up from people staying at home. Anyway, I would like to look into three uh, different areas where I think 
uh, the pandemic is going to transform the way we live and prioritize in life forever. Uh, so those uh, I picked especially for this chapter. And before I delve into that, I think um, one thing that we all have in common is that we have moved from not understanding exponentiality at all, except from some crazy futurists talking about disruption and things were going really fast. Uh, suddenly we now understand that one person gives it to two people who gives it to four, to eight, to 16 and 32 and so forth. So suddenly we understand exponentiality. And I think that is actually key for getting out of this crisis again. Suddenly we should start caring about what is actually going on in other countries because it could hit us in the very back that we're sitting in. That goes for the environment, that goes for technological change. So, so uh, even though we are very nation-based right now, we have this global sensation that things are indeed going to touch upon our lives. Uh, so the three areas, the first area I wanna touch on is that we're moving from hospitals to home hospitals. And you can say this was a trend that was already moving on with telemedication, people having many different diseases at once. So they shouldn't be in the hospital, they should be really treated at home with their close families. And that has just accelerated like crazy uh, during this time because uh, you don't want to go to hospital. <laughs> That's where you can get seriously ill. You want to do it yourself. It has moved from being a, a private matter to a highly public matter. You have to uh, take good care of, of your relatives. You have to talk about your own health. And that is really a trend that is changing for good now. And it's not only preventing the pandemic, it could be preventing diabetes. It could be pre preventing cancer. The whole point is that the focus has ended up on our shoulders. So you go and visit people and they will say, oh, this is my health center. And they will tell you about all the gadgets they have to measure temperatures, uh, all the special drugs they have. Some are from the pharmacy, some are from the herbalists. And, and so you have a lot of hedonistic uh, sensation. Maybe some people want to sleep in a pyramid uh, because they think that will you know, maintain their, their energy. So, so we're really moving healthcare into a kind of preventive care and it's gonna happen in our own households. Uh, so that's a huge transition. And going back to, to the abundance scenario, uh, one thing also pointing into this is the digitalization. And that really goes for all these three uh, areas. You get so many data points, <clears throat> so you can predict, am I happy? Am I sad? Am I about to stress down now? And uh, there we can really have the fundament, the data fundaments for creating a well-being budget. And that's what they are doing in New Zealand right now. And I expect that to be exported as a health measure because uh, you can actually then find out, well, maybe investing in uh, mental health care uh, is an investment rather than a, a cost because people who are doing well uh, in psychological terms, they will get a job, they will get a network, they will get out of this corona well enough. So we start having these new data points will give us completely new epiphanies as to how to keep the population healthy. And maybe at the state leader level, people are not collaborating, but they are at the scientific level. They actually take care and they exchange information. So you have a whole sub layer there going on right now exchanging information as to what could become important. So I, I'm a little sad that the new welfare state is actually coming from New Zealand, but hopefully we will uh, take some of their insights as well. The second one is moving from what I call work life to life work. What do I mean by that is that we spend so much time at home now, so our home life has to define our work life. So we come back to our work life now and we actually say, hey, I'm the sort of person who actually are not thinking creatively before 11 o'clock in the morning. I should never get in before that. Uh, in, in Denmark, we had um, the schools opening. Uh, instead of every kid moving into school at eight o'clock, they can come between eight and nine. Just changing that a little bit in our mobility has completely unblocked the roads. It has been so great for everybody. They're not, not sitting in the same line in the morning. So it takes a very little system change to get the flow of people moving. And then of course we will uh, now see, so why should we work on a distance? 
while Twitter is taking it to extreme, basically closing down uh, all their jobs uh, in, in the labor market, putting all the people at home, that is too extreme. But what we will see from working at a distance is that uh, soon we will have this AI measuring exactly what did Rohit said, what did Sheila said, what did Paul said. Then you have your own little executive summary uh, exactly to your needs if you're working within finance or insurance. You will have um, pattern recognitions that can say, okay, Lisa really listened in at this point, at this point she was bored. And then you can have a simultaneous translation. We will have avatars in this virtual reality going for meetings. We have the gamer generation coming now and they will be completely, we'll forget that we are not actually there. So, so these virtual layers will bring those back to the workplaces. So all the great things of working at a distance. That said, uh, we'll still have troubles in regard to being innovative. We'll have a feedback crisis if we never meet. I really think that's gonna be the case of the coworkers at Twitter, if they don't actually join forces. Uh, talking about losing your job, power politics, you have to be close to other people in order to conduct that. So we'll find out, we'll be far more aware of um, our life work. So do I have a vulnerable, uh, husband or wife, uh, how is my children's situation, how is my commuting situation, and that will define our work life. So, so I think that transition has come to stay. The final one is uh, especially within education, you have all the kids in India having had homeschooling and you have all these data points again showing us that it's crazy giving people 45 minutes lectures. They need micro learning, they need adaptivity, uh, they need it to be tailored to their specific needs. And here you have the YouTuber generation really coming in, bringing different educational items together in order to get the specific training they need to solve a specific problem. So uh, they go on YouTube, they find out how to make a cake, they go to the kitchen and they bake it while doing a TikTok video. They are extremely creative and the um, Corona time has really forced them to be extremely creative in, in creating their own universe. And you can say, but that's not according to what the teachers are telling them to do. But on the other hand, we see this creative bubble, which will really challenge the traditional educational systems as we know it, because you gave them time off on their own, and uh, they are not going back to just sit on a chair and listen to what the teacher is saying at the back of the room. So here we have a transition that is going to last as well. Finally, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, you are yeah. on mute. So I can just finish saying uh, these are three out of, of five areas I'm picking. But when I selected this for the chapter of the book, I thought, okay, so where are the lasting impacts going to be? It's not that I'm not going to say that we're going through a, a difficult time. And especially for the last one, I'll say it's not only a matter of being rich and poor in the future. It's also a matter of a generation of people who are binging, who are scared, who can't see themselves at the new labor market, who don't know how to put their competences into play, who don't know how to plug into lifelong learning and development. And then you have another group of kids who are saying, hell, we don't want to be the lost generation with first the financial crisis, then the pandemic that we had to solve, and now we get the environmental crisis. We're going to fix this ourselves, you know. And uh, so, so, so we see a split there and we see a split amongst generation as well uh, coming up. But I just thought I would bring the positive from onlooker to creator. It can go the other way as well, unfortunately. So I'm going to curtail my question just so that we kind of stay on time. But I've got one key question to focus on. Um, I hear a lot at the moment about how wonderful this transition has been for the kids who have access to technology and the parents who will provide enough support to get the kids using the technology till they become self-sufficient. But across the planet, there are an awful lot more kids who have none of that. They're not even getting paper to take home. They've basically been abandoned for a few months. And you're hearing some teachers saying, it's not like the summer holidays where they come back and we have to two weeks to re-socialize them. Here we're talking about a period where their parents have been depressed, they've been detached, 
we could be talking about years, if ever, to get these kids back into normal education. How do we make sure that this conversation about rethinking education doesn't become a very wealthy nation focused conversation and a wealthy area focused conversation? And we start to think about a really inclusive model going forward that, that deals with the people who are at the extremes rather than the people who are the most privileged. Uh, I, I completely agree with you there with very, very nice comment. Um, I think within the healthcare crisis, we actually had different profession merging together, solving, uh, putting up uh, ways that people could get uh, serious help and that happened really fast. Looking at the educational system, unfortunately, we haven't had that collective approach where teachers came together with parents who came together with the neighbors, where old folks said, well, I can take my group of five children. Unfortunately, it has happened in few pockets, but we will not look back at the educational system and think here we saw the heroes of the pandemic crisis, unfortunately, because they had that chance. They had ways to, to make subgroups, but it is difficult because we have been through a situation, a huge crisis. So any alcoholism, any drug abuse, everything has been magnified greatly during this um, period. So, so we will have a, a lost group of kids as well. Okay, um, let's take your polling question then I can see some great questions coming in from the attendees. So we're gonna use those. So let's get your polling question up on screen. Uh, what areas in your everyday life will undergo the greatest transformation as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, so this is a very personal question because I thought, yeah, let's look at society, but I'd rather hear your own point of view because sometimes you, you have to keep, hold up the mirror for yourself for a moment. And you can vote for more than one people. You don't have to just choose one. It's multiple choice. Should I try to look at some of the Q&A? Yeah, I'm going to pick a couple of these that I think are good for all of the panel to talk about. Okay. Five more seconds to get your votes in if you haven't already. And let's get them up on screen. Ooh, exciting. There you go. Okay. So the work life moving from life work, <laughs> uh, the life work balance. Great. Yeah, I think so too. For now, anyway. I think the health uh, is also with the close fitness centers and everything. People have to take care of their health during this period of time. They can't just go to plazas anymore. So maybe you haven't thought about it, but you're actually in charge of your health to a greater extent than you have been before. The one about lifelong learning is interesting because when this started, everyone was saying, oh, we'd all be doing micro learning online. We'd be learning how to knit carpets and, you know, sew baskets or whatever, you know. Yeah. But actually, this totally reflects the experience of all my friends. Where about 20% have done any kind of new learning online. And 80% mm -hmm. have a kind of sense of, well, I should have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the environmental concern, I think I'm, I'm glad it's still there that it hasn't gone to zero. Uh, but I think we have a huge clash of generations. If the elderly who are sitting on the money and the banks right now on the managerial positions are not taking the environmental concern serious, I see that in the Q&A, that they will really get angry because they have to stay here for the next 120 years. They will get a hard time getting into education now. They'll get a hard time going into the labor market. They have to pay off all this debt. So if we do not rebuild society with an environmental uh, part, uh, we could seriously get some clashes there. And I think that leads us quite well into some of the questions. Here's... here's um... Uh, a good question coming from Luis Vasquez, uh, which is a good one for all the panel actually. So building on what uh, Lisa said, uh, will all this help and push us to come back to roots, to connect back with our human nature and with mother nature and to evolve as humankind? 
or will it turn into a global all worlds 1984 scenario with a huge gap between the elite and rest of mortals, more hunger, less freedom, and more power into the machines to control us with the health excuse? And, and I'm going to, I'll come back to you to close on this, Lisa. Look, let's start with uh, Paul. You can go first with your response to what Lisa said, but also to this question. A bit of cynicism in that um, last bit there, but I mean, you know, I I I agree wholeheartedly with 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 everything that uh, Lisa said, and, and I and I'm just going to segue quite nicely into, into uh, my chapter because this piece about you know moving from life focus to work to life, you know, the, the you know the spinning spinning that balance. You know, I think was a big theme that came out of, uh, uh, of, the, of the work that I did. I'm, I am no, I'm in no doubt, you know, that um, if, if nothing else comes out of this, I think we will end up with a, with a, with a kinder and probably more tolerant um, society. And, and that's, you know, I, I genuinely believe that will happen. I certainly and, and, and pray and hope that. Uh, that that will happen because because certainly you know the the outpouring of of, of goodwill for, for health and the key workers and that kind of stuff I think has has been a real relation uh, of this and, and I hope that you know going back to the comments we made earlier about leadership and politicians you know I, I sincerely hope that many of them are really going to sit up and take notice of this you know thinking forward to future elections and uh, and political campaigning and so forth right. Sheila, your take on both what Lisa said and that question about yeah. are we looking to a brave new world or a, a, a horrible new world? <laughs> um, coming to first, first to, to what Lisa Lotta was saying, um, very interesting and, and some, some interesting uh, takes. Certainly the, 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 the life work is something I picked up as, as, as well as you, Paul, in, in, in your chapter, and I'll, I'll touch on it, it very briefly. Um, and I think the, the moving towards taking responsibility for our own health is, 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 is something that I looked at a, quite a long time ago and, and that this shift towards our own choices and our taking responsibility and that that would go hand in hand with prevention um, but needs support and, and really good information. And as you say, seeing things like mental health or, or community care as investment, um, not as a cost. And I, I think that that is, is a huge, um, huge change. And, and we really need to, to, to see it in those terms. And I think, as you were saying, Paul, I think the, 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 the appreciation that, that key workers and not just the national health, but care workers, uh, but also the, the, the refuse collectors, the, the street cleaners, the, the bus drivers and, and so on, and the way that they have kept the world going in really the face of quite a lot of danger. We've all been nice and safe, tucked away at home going, well, I'm not going anywhere and I'm, I'm staying safe and, and so on. They've had no choice. And, and I think that that you know, deserves that recognition in, in, in that, you know, seeing it as an investment. Thank you. Lisa, do you want to... Um... Give us your final thoughts and then we'll move on to the next session then. So any, any reflections? But that was on the climate, right? Well, this, this question of are we moving to a... a, a yes, I a, forgot a, to answer that. Sorry. The big brother the and the climate. Or, yeah, I, got, I got that. Right. And I think I'll, I'll, uh, we are no doubt uh, moving to a much more crazy scenarios than 1984 because you can actually read the mind of people now. Uh, just from mm -hmm. looking at the brain waves and the mimicry, so so we have seen nothing yet. Uh, the question is what we're going to use it for, because it's going to be like having electricity; it's just going to be there. I think the climate question is really interesting, but um, let's come get, back to that later. Let's come can back. Can we do that? Okay, we'll do that in the that's... final Q and A because otherwise okay. we'll eat the time of the other two. Okay, thank you. Excellent session, um, Paul. Let's move straight on to you to talk about your chapter and then we'll do the same with you. Okay, well there's some, as I said, there's some nice segues from, from Lisa's piece that, that feed in, into mine. I should perhaps first just give a little bit of background as to where the idea for my chapter came from and, and you know, bearing in mind we live in the, in the internet era and this is probably the first real global crisis that's happened of the, of the internet age. Um, I was just playing around on Facebook 
one day and I saw the post of a, of a friend of mine who basically invited his friends to comment on, on their, their views of what the, the long-term impacts uh, of the pandemic would be. And he, he posted three rather unscientific questions, uh, which I have in, in front of me here. He, he said, what, do you, what will you appreciate more uh, when this is all over? What do you think will never be the same again? Uh, what do you think will be the positive takeaways? And then I spent uh, two or three days waiting and watching all the different feeds come in to this post. There, there were quite a lot of them. You know, and I covered a variety of themes and, and topics. Um, and it, it me, there's an incredible amount of consistency uh, across the, uh, the responses uh, to this post. And, 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 I would, and I would say, you know, overall, there was a lot of positivity, hell of a lot of positivity, uh, and a collective will to see change. And, and then I started to group um, the responses, you know, being, being the good consultant uh, and with all my economic training and stuff, they kind of fell into the political, economic, social, and technological boxes of a pest analysis. So I, so I categorized them that way. But in addition to that, there was an awful lot of personal comments as well. So I added a, a fifth one, which is uh, individual. So uh, I now have what I call a pesty uh, analysis. Maybe I should, you know, uh, put a copyright. Uh, on that, on that, but but to just summarise just some of the themes that came out in those, uh, those those five buckets, you know, sort of from the from the political one, um, you know, a lot of people were talking about, you know, the, the need for greater political transparency. And I mean, you know, if you go back to the beginning of this stuff and how the, you know, the Chinese initially tried to cover it up, pretty much in in the same way that if you go back to Chernobyl, you know, the, you know, the Soviets tried to cover up uh, Chernobyl. We, we live in an age now where, you know, it's, it's very hard to cover up something like this, particularly when everybody's catching it. Uh, and so I think, you know, uh, the need for transparency in the future, I think, you know, is, 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 is a must. You know, and going back to one of the earlier comments we made at the beginning uh, of, of this session, you know, I do believe that, you know, second time around, because I think there will be future pandemics, whether it's a re, a re-emergence of coronavirus or something new. I think there has to be some kind of coordination uh, of infrastructure uh, and resources. You know, at a at a global level, whether that's led by the UN or any other or, or some other body or or whatever. You know, maybe here's another opportunity for you, Rebecca. You know, but. You know, I, I do believe there will be a, a greater need, uh, and certainly a lot of the posts in, the, in this this uh, this Facebook thread tended to suggest that we need a much better overall response. Because bearing in mind this survey went out in the very early days of this, you know, what we've come to learn since, you know, is that there were very many different um, ways that people responded in the early days, and it was clear there wasn't one clear right or wrong way to handle it. Moving into the economic uh, considerations or thoughts that people had, clearly many, many uh, comments in these, in these posts were talking about the impact uh, on local businesses. We all have friends who run uh, local businesses, not just shops, but people who provide local services, uh, um, you know, and, and some of these businesses, you know, we hope they come back. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of forecasts. Uh, that many local and small businesses are going to suffer and go to the wall uh, as a consequence of this crisis. But just reading through these these comments, you know, there's a lot of encouragement for people as soon as the lockdown is lifted to start shopping local uh, again, to resist the temptation to go to the big chain stores and 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 to shop from Amazon and to go and shop with your local corner shop. And and you know, and, and I think there's a general you know, as I say, one of the real positives coming out of this is people are thinking about their communities, you know, and, and, and their local local residents. Although having said that, you know, we've seen a dramatic rise in e-commerce, you know, and the number of people are saying they've tried e-shopping for the first time ever. And, and I know from, from working with uh, another company, you know, we've seen you know, something like a six to tenfold increase in e-commerce take up um, during the two months uh, of this pandemic before. And I th as I was saying to you earlier, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of small businesses 
you know, you know, I remember you know, something like 40% of 40% plus of small businesses globally still haven't gone online, you know, and a lot of those who thought they could survive without any kind of online connection, many now realizing that they do still need some kind of basic internet presence. So that's another consequence we see of this. The social impacts, I think, have been touched on a lot by, uh, by my, my co-collaborators here, but the community mobilization, you know, just general human resilience, I think, has been uh, phenomenal, you know, and then just quickly on to technology, you know, I think the whole tech adoption of remote working uh, technologies, video conferencing, that kind of stuff, I think there are going to be massive long-term consequences of this. I think it's going to change work habits. I think it's going to change travel habits. You know, I think a lot of companies, you know, who are going to need to start looking at their books and their finances moving forward are going to, are going to probably put an end to all non-essential business travel as a means of kind of rebalancing their books. And that's something that we may need to think more about longer term. And then finishing up on the individual threads, and there were lots of them, but it's been touched on by, by Lisa, you know, the, the focus on personal well-being, you know, the, the, the change in work life to life work balance, and the whole how, how we use our time. You know, I mean, you know, I, I live just north of London in the, in the commuter belt. You know, and, and a lot of my friends, you know, who I talk to, who are used to spending three hours a day in public transport, you know, or, or more, have suddenly got three hours a day that they didn't have before, you know, because they were busy sitting on a newspaper playing with their iPad or, uh, or reading, reading the newspaper. And I think that is going to have massive long-term consequences in terms of how people see the value of that extra time they've had in the day, whether it be spending more time with their children, focusing on their personal well-being, learning a new skill, as you say, lifetime learning, uh, and that kind of stuff. So, so in summary, you know, the sort of social and overall impacts, you know, that, that, that I focus on, you know, and, and try and draw some conclusions on or this general optimism, you know, that has come out of this and respect for key workers, even getting to know your neighbours and your community. I mean, I've, I've lived in the same street for nearly, you know, for over 30 years. And some of my neighbours I've only just got to meet in the last two months and I feel hellishly embarrassed you know, but the fact is, you know, I've made new connections and, uh, and new friends through this. And I think there's, there will be some huge long-term benefits uh, to come out of a, a real social uh, and personal level. And as I, and as I put in the close to my chapter, if, if we achieve nothing else out of this, I think, you know, there's a general optimism. There's a huge respect for the people who work in key positions, not just in the health service. And I hope if we end up with a more tolerant and, tolerant and kinder society, then maybe coronavirus hasn't been a bad thing after all. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, just one question before we take your polling question and then open it up for discussion. Uh, very optimistic, um, very positive. I, I wonder how far this analysis travels. You know, is this something that applies really well to if you like, middle class and, and developed nations with access to technology. And would we be able to say the same things about people who have less, who, you know, uh, are confined to tiny space, living spaces? You know, is this a universal set of truths that we're talking about here or something that really is for those who are relatively comfortably off, but to start off with? Well, the well, short answer is no, it's not a universal set of truths because it's based on on a chat room, you know, between a bunch of my friends, you know, who, who you know, most, of, you know, have a really pretty decent lifestyle. They live around uh, the home counties and whatever. And, I, and, I, and I'm not sure what kind of responses you'd got had you run this, you know, in, in you know, in somewhere in South Africa or, or, or another, you know, economy that, that is suffering uh, right now. But I think there is, you know, and, and, I, and I do have a number of friends, you know, all over the world and in Asia and, and Africa. And, and, and I think there is a general mood of positive, certainly the, the whole community spirit thing, I think that is pretty common. Um, you know, wherever you look, you know, the whole idea of singing from your balconies, you know, started in Italy and you've seen that carried into Spain and Brazil and Mexico and, uh, and other countries. So I think the whole community spirit thing 
you know, I, I, I think is sort of wide, very wide reaching. I, I think perhaps some of the political uh, and economic impacts, however, will be very different depending on, you know, which part of the world and which country you're living in. Interesting media point there that uh, the media is kind of love to paint the idea that the singing started in Spain. It actually started in China. I, mean, I, th- I thought it was in Italy. I, I, I saw the, 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 the opera from the, from the yeah. balconies. Yeah. You know, if you and Wuhan were out singing the Chinese national anthem and all sorts of uh, kind of liberation songs and all sorts of things when it started, because when they were on lockdown. Uh, but we don't mm-hmm. talk about that we, we kind of, because we want to make China bad quite a lot of the time. Um, uh, while we're on this spirit of optimism, though, I'm going to take a question from the audience first, and then we'll go to your polling question. So Sandra Jowett says, fascinating discussion, share the pessimism, but, um, but would welcome comments on what we can do personally and professionally to influence the outcome we would prefer. Let's just take a minute from each of you on one thing we could do personally or professionally to uh, create the, own out, the outcome we want for ourselves. Let's start with you, Paul, as it's your question. Well, I, I think being a, a naturally positive and optimistic person, I think you have to carry that through to all facets, you know, of how you live your life and how you communicate um, with your cohorts, your co-workers and, uh, and the people you come into contact with, you know, and, and, and where you counter the opposite, that, opposite to that. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't believe there's two sides to every coin and everyone you know, has, has different opinions to try and understand why people who don't think like you do are thinking the way they do, you know, because, you, you know, the only way you can change somebody's, somebody else's opinion or influence somebody else's to opinion is to try and understand where they come from, uh, you know, in, in, in order to have to shape that opinion in the first place. So, I, you know, I'm, I am a firm believer that, you know, positivity does rub off on people in the same way that when you meet someone and you smile at them, they tend to smile back at you. So. Yeah, I think things can be reciprocal. Sheila, your minute. Um, thank you. Um, I think what we can do is is really, I suppose it's it's walk the talk, and it's it's recognizing, and, and you mentioning the the, the smile. Um, small acts of kindness have been shown to have hugely beneficial uh, uh, effects in in all sorts of situations whether it's giving up your seat or in in the in the train or 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 helping someone or or or, you know if someone is in need giving giving them some some a small amount of money or whatever so i think the first thing is is actually sort of that old thing from the, the the book called the water babies do as you would be done by you know if you want people to be kind to you then perhaps be kind and polite and i think politeness has become a very underrated quality um and please and thank you or whatever is is hugely beneficial thank you i think as employers and colleagues i think it's seeing the person and remembering to see the person which is very similar in 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 many ways um and i think many employers tend to forget to see the person they see the resource or the income thank you lisa your minute Uh, my my answer is building off what sheila actually says and it's avoiding the feedback crisis we had already before the pandemic a situation where people didn't talk to each other anymore they simply didn't lifted the phone and talk they wrote text messages now we meet online and we do not gather anymore at the workplaces as we used to do. And soon we will have a chatbot which will listen to our every wish and we will discuss with Siri rather than a real person. So what we need is a human touch. You need to find uh, the network around you. That could be the neighbor you didn't know before <laughs> two months ago, Paul, uh, or someone else. But you need to ask them, you know, what do you think is my game changer? We go home blind all the time and we cannot see the future on our own. So we need to keep asking people, how do you think I could move? And in this situation, we should move like the night when you play chess. You can't just disrupt yourself and start something completely new where you don't have the competences. You have to say, so what are my skills? What am I good at? Where are my strength sites? And how could I apply it? Maybe a slightly different. And luckily we get so many ideas coming out right now where people are showing incredible inspiration. We had this guy who's doing a UV uh, um, for, for pharma, he's now using it handheld for, for daycare, uh, for, for making it uh, more hygienic. So we see all these professional borders 
uh, changing at the moment. I think so. That's how you should look at you yourself, not as a, a profession, but as a professional. Excellent. The one I would add is uh, this is a perfect time to give ourselves permission. No one's watching. So whether you're exactly. trying to learn tango in your front room, or you know learning what machine intel uh, machine learning is about or just learning how they do whatever it is that you've always been fascinated about. Like, how do they make pasta? Now is an incredible time to do micro learning, to try stuff, and then to feed that into our conversations with our colleagues, to bring a bit of real world richness and diversity. And, and what I hear is that the organizations that don't get webinar fatigue in their organization, they've worked out how to bring some fun, how to bring some conversation, how to bring something of people's home lives into the, the, the discussions that they're having all day long on screen. So let's take, um, let's take the polling question, Paul, and see, uh, see what people think about your, uh, your question. Uh, Paul, Here's polling, go. So again, you can vote for any and all of these options. Okay, another few seconds just for people to cast their last votes. I think the answers are fascinating that you're about to see. Paul, would you like to comment on what you see on screen? Wow. Um, I'm not surprised by um, that first one because probably everybody on this call right now you know, has, has experienced this over, over the last two months. Um, so I, I kind of expected um, that one to be high. I'm, and, and I'm also pleased to see, you know, that the, the second one there is the high end of work, you know, because, you know, I just, I think people are now a lot more conscious you know, about, about their health and well-being. Uh, and um, so, so I'm not at all surprised um, by that, um, you know, I, I thought the uh, uh, I thought that there might be a, a little bit of a kick. You know, if you, I wonder if you did this survey just in London, uh, whether the reduced use of public transport might might be a little bit bigger. Because I've noticed already in in the local news here in in London, people are already commenting that even with you know over half of the workforce uh, or, or three quarters of the workforce at home the tubes are still uh, a, a little bit too packed. But <clears throat> then, then again, you know, those of us who are used to living in and around London, you know, the tubes are, you know, if, if the tubes just existed on people being two metres apart from each other, you know, you'd need a, you'd, you'd need a tube literally every five seconds, I think. The yeah. one that interests me is the contradiction between greater use of remote working and yet, you know, the second lowest one is around fewer events and conferences. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if that's because quite a few of the people on this call are people from the meetings industry or, you know, people who speak as part of their living and therefore... Well, that's a good uh, point. You know, I mean, you know, I, you know I, I work with a company that organises events, as you know, you've attended some of them and, you know, and, and we heavily depend on, on, on those events and, and exhibitions for our income and, you know, or for a large chunk of our income. So, you know, even if that reduces, then, then you, you know, companies, you know, as I touched on it in, in my piece, have got to look for new revenue streams and, 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 and new ways of deriving income and engaging with customers. Excellent. Okay. In the interest of time, I am going to uh, move us on to Sheila. So, Sheila, would you like to take a few minutes to tell us about the theme of your chapter and then we'll take some questions in your poll. Okay. Question. Uh, thank, thanks a lot and, and good evening everybody. Um, I 
as, as I alluded to earlier, my background is in horizon scanning and I'd been looking at all the changes going on and, and huge numbers of change. And I think one of the interesting things is the way that they will combine and provide that opportunity for, for, for a rethink that we've, we've all, all touched on. I came down on, on five areas of change and I'll try and touch on, on each of them very, very briefly. Um, the rush to online, as you've already alluded to, to Paul, was, was, is the most obvious one. Um, just about everything has gone online. Um, and one of the interesting things that we're beginning to see in terms of your life work balance, uh, Lisa Lotta, is that there's been a huge surge in the number of people looking at properties outside cities um, because people have realised, ah, I don't need to commute. I don't need to commute certainly every day. I can live where I want to live and work differently. And I think that will begin to impact in commercial property so not only will we see the problem of, of shops being affected by the huge shift to online, but also commercial offices, I think, will, will begin to, to feel the pinch. Um, so we may have lots of room to live in the cities, but actually nobody wanting to live there. But fewer, more homes are needed. Supply chains, huge disruption. Big discussion at the beginning of the, of the pandemic that one of our problems was a lack of a diagnostic industry. Um, and the other side of it was the huge levels of collaboration and innovation that went on very, very quickly. The, the, the Mercedes um, um, group uh, put together a, a, a revised CPAP breathing machine in the space of a few weeks and got it onto the market, um, which was radically improved. After the pandemic, what would be fantastic if that level of innovation and collaboration can concede um, oops, um, so that, that that level of collaboration and, and innovation can really begin to, to grow and take us forward in a new way and, and build back better in, in some way. Again, yes, the essential workers um, came, uh, came up in, in, in mine. Everybody has been clapping, praising, um, goodness knows what. But I think one of the things that we're going to have to do is put our money where our mouth is. Um, we're going to have to learn to love tax, in other words. We're going to have to learn and be willing to pay people at a level that they deserve, having put in this huge, um, huge amount of effort on our behalf. And the, the, the indication of the changes was the outcry in the UK, certainly. Um, the government were going to levy £624 per family member for any family of an overseas worker um, to use the NHS. That included care workers, NHS workers, and um, goodness knows what. There was a huge outcry and the UK government have now backtracked and they've said, okay, we'll, 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 we'll ditch the, the, um, that, that fee. Um, so again, a change of people wanting to value people in a, in a much more fundamental way. Companies afterwards may be judged uh, by consumers and individuals and found very wanting. There have been lots of examples of CEOs giving up lots of pay, but their companies actually not doing much for the rest of their employees. Meanwhile, a lot of companies have been doing good things like little local shops giving reductions to NHS workers, Unilever did, do, uh, donating uh, sanitizer, co-op have been donating vouchers and things. So actually making an effort to, to do something constructive. And I read just recently that Danone in, in France have become the first entreprise à mission, which is under a new um, designation under a French law that was passed last year. Um, and this is a, a company recognized as having a social uh, meaning, a social fun function. In, and so I think that's again, a, an early indication of where we could be heading. Public spaces was my fifth one. Again, things like fear of the underground, fear of public transport, people wanting to feel safe, whether it was inside or out. Um, and so reconfiguring our, our public spaces. Um, and we've already seen cities such as London, Milan, Newcastle, um, making huge shifts in terms of making places more walkable, um, giving greater 
the space to pedestrians, to bikes. We may see far more e-bikes um, coming on board. And the CEO of, of Barclays recently said he cannot see 7,000 people coming together in the same place in, in the future, that that was a thing of the past. Twitter, as you said, uh, Lisa Lotta, have actually said that if you don't want to come into the office, you don't have to. They haven't sort of banned, banned the office because there are obviously huge benefits to being together. So coming together, I think what we may have, and my optimism is returning here, um, we may have what I've called a, a sort of pandemic pivot um, to a rethink that we can begin to rebuild better. Um, we can look for a new, uh, more sustainable world and a, a form of economics and capitalism that is more inclusive and more um, stakeholder rather than just shareholder oriented. So that's it. You're on mute. It's probably the best way to hear me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, sign language. I was um, going to take it. There's a question here then that sort of really ties into that, that point. I'm going to take it from the audience. It's from Mejdi Sarumi. No, Sarahui. Sorry, my uh, pronunciation is terrible. But uh, to what extent do you agree that the economy was downward anyway prior to the pandemic outbreak? Has this only accelerated the process? So it sort of ties into what you've been talking about around. Are we talking, are we talking global or? Globally, I think, um, yes. globally. Yeah, I think if we're talking global, I think. Um, gro I, yes, I think to a degree in that many countries were slowing. China had been slowing anyway. And although the US was growing, we were certainly not doing very well. And, and the EU was, was, was struggling. Um, I don't think. I think one of the things that will shift, and this may be, uh, again, my optimism returning, is that we will begin to redefine growth and that we will hopefully begin to look for different indicators so that they're not just ind uh, economic indicators. So although we may be talking in terms of an economic downturn, that we may actually see um, the benefits of how we do other things and the contribution of others in, in a different way. If you, I, I can't remember what the cost was, but the, someone once calculated the cost of replacing a housewife in adverted commas, and it was in the days of a housewife. And the actual sum was, was huge. It was even in the 80s, it was something like 150,000 pounds a year. Um, but most of that contribution is uncosted. It doesn't go into GDP. And I think if we Re can re rethink how we look at economic growth and see it as contribution and then we start to measure things differently and we begin to see things very differently. Sorry Sheila I've just had to put you on mute just in case my wife heard your last comment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well while you're there Paul let's, uh, let, let's tell you do you think that this is this has just exacerbated the problems of a global economy that was already on a downward spiral? Uh, to an extent, yes, I, I, I think it, I think it has, and I, and I think it will force um, a lot of countries to rethink where they put some of their focus and where and their attention uh, going forward. You know, I, I think you know when, when, if you see the way that people have responded to this, you know, I, I think there will be those governments will think that you know it's it's. You know, finding the solution isn't about just how you make money and that kind of stuff. It's about, you know, you know. I think the the, the greater social conscience, you know, will emerge in, in in many different countries. And and even if that doesn't come from politicians, I think it will come from the people because I think you're seeing that already. You know, and if you and if you read the trends and see the feeds on on all the various social channels, you know, you know, I think. You know, you cannot ignore, you know, in, in this age that we now live in, that the people have a voice, you know, and, and when they when they get together and where they share, you know, and things go viral, you know, uh, you know, I mean, things can happen very quickly. I mean, this this thing we have in the UK now, we're on a Thursday night at eight o'clock, we all, you know, clap for our, our NHS and our, and our key workers. You know, that started as a small local idea, you know, and within a week, you know, you know, spread across the whole country. You know, the 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 other campaign we've had here with this, 
you know, Colonel Tom, uh, who, you know, in the space of a week went from, you know, being a, a, a rather lonely 100-year-old guy trying to raise a, a little bit of money for charity. And instead of raising a thousand pounds, which was his original objective, he's now raised 33 million uh, and been knighted a month later. It's amazing what happens, you know, in this socially connected, uh, interconnected world that we now live. So Lisa, just building on that point, David Burns has asked the question of, you know, with the cost of all these bailout packages, is the world bankrupt? And I would add a rider to that, which is, does it matter? Yeah. Because, is. you know, a lot of the money that we paid out still this time around, by far more money has been given to the financial markets mm. to stop them misbehaving than has been given to the real economy. So does it matter if we go bankrupt? Does it matter if the debt that we've created artificially gets wiped out because no one can pay it? Does any of this matter? Lisa, you're Have we lost Lisa? No, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, it, it matters to the extent that uh, if we can't afford to do anything about the climate, suddenly, or we don't think we can afford that, and if we lose a whole generation who can't get into the labor market. I actually think that we were moving into a crisis already in that we had aging population in China, in Europe, in the States, in Japan. So I thought the power balance was moving. And now... Mm -hmm everything uh, from digitalization and automation is moving really fast ahead. So I'm actually looking to India. I think finally India is going to have their heydays. They have a lot of young people. They are online. They are able to, to reach out and they can train themselves and they have a different demographic profile. So I think, uh, I think uh, we, we will see new power structures emerging. Okay. Uh, with that, let's take Sheila's polling question. Um, let's get your question up on screen. And again, this is a multiple <clears throat> choice question about uh, the kind of outcomes of the next two years of the changes that have started during this period. And again, you can vote for any and all. Ah, there you go. I could see no votes coming. But... I while, while this is going on, Rome, I, I would make one comment. I think the the fifth point down, I, I I could easily split because you know I think there would be reduced demand for office space. I think there may be more demand for traditional shop space. Just a Possibly. comment. Possibly, yeah. Okay. Another 10 seconds for people to vote. Yes, it almost is a, a wrong question because it's got two components. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 I, and I think they could go, they could both go separate ways. Yeah. Yeah. Electric cars and bikes? No. Electric cars and electric bikes. Yeah, they could be, they're both, they're different. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Lisa, just before we uh, share the results, my son had to leave for dinner, but he said he, he had to leave after your session. He said he agrees with your points. So oh, you have it you. from the highest authority. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're on, you're on message with a 20 year old. <laughs> okay, here, here are the results. Oh no, did they, have they got up? They, they mentioned, oh, there they are. Here we are. Mm -hmm. Can you reduce demand for shops? Sheila, your comments. Well, it's gratifying that, that lots of people think um, the, the essential workers are going to, to get a, a, a better pay and conditions. Um, I suppose, I think the reduced demand for, for um, office space, I think, is... Is, is going to happen. It's, it's the, the, the move online, the way in which we work will simply radically reduce, I think, the amount of, of, uh, of office space that is needed. Um, in term, the, the, the way people have said about, about splitting that, that one and, and Paul's comment about possibly um, traditional shop space um, increasing, 
Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure because of the shift online. I think what we may see is what from what you were saying, Paul, about local shops um, becoming more more in demand. But the the traditional big shopping centres um, that are already really struggling, I think they will continue to to to, to struggle. Yeah, yeah, shopping as a destination um activity will 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 just well why would you do that sort of thing um and and i i think um the the, the, the it makes me a bit sad that the, the the green responses are are perhaps the lowest the, the the electric bikes and electric cars or the the demand for a green recovery but you know they're, they're getting 30 percent so the, the fact that people think that, that that is a, a likely outcome from, from the combination of events, um, especially, I mean, um, Greta Thunberg, you know, she has disappeared, obviously, during the, during the, uh, the pandemic, but the, the momentum that she was building in terms of some of the changes and Extinction Rebellion and, and things, I, I think that will come roaring back once people begin to look up and, and say, well, where are we going to go now? And, and we do want a better future. And if people don't want to commute and they want that cleaner air, then an electric bike um, for short distances is, is the better option if you don't want to arrive all sweaty. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult to know why people have voted the way they voted, but the interesting one is that sort of juxtaposed with that is the redesigned cities for walkability and health. And I really like the fact that, yeah. you know, around two thirds are saying, yeah, that, and that, that sort of goes in the green direction. And maybe yes. people yeah. are just saying, we won't need our cars and our bikes as much. Yeah. Whether they're... But it's already happening, yeah. Rohit, in, in, in London. We've had yeah. cycle lanes painted while, whilst we've been in lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and whole, whole shot, uh, street systems are being, are being, um, made one way and and you know payments are being made one way and all sorts of things so that people can can distance more and i think that is a, a very positive thing and that might apply also to buildings yeah i, I am <laughs> not sure about the office thing i i think on the one hand you can see companies making the offer and people doing it but i think there's something about the socialization piece mm -hmm. so two weeks ago i was thinking yeah people will be happy in the last two weeks, I've heard so many people complaining. And a friend of mine is uh, like mm. chief operating officer of Bangalore Airport. And he was saying that they haven't told anyone to come back to work. Everyone just has because <laughs> they're missing their colleagues. They're missing the work environment. And they're actually mm. getting a headache from being on screen all the time having yeah. meetings. And they're saying, can't I just sit next to you and talk, you know, two meters apart? But mm. can't we just sit in a big room and do this because we're, you know, staring at the screen is driving me insane. Mm. Um, so I, 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 think I, don't think, yeah. I don't think online will be in, entirely online. I mean, I think it will be <clears throat> it will be a hybrid. It won't be all or nothing. I think that's the critical thing. But I don't think you need a huge reduction in numbers at any one time to start seeing a reduction in, in office space. I mean, it won't all disappear. Um, but I think there will be a, 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 a significant, you know, enough, enough people not working all of the time, which was the original thing of teleworking, as it was called back in the early 80s. And Trish, and you one have, of the aims was yeah. to reduce overheads, and I think that will happen. Yeah, and Trish, you oh. makes a point in the chat that, you know, some people may increase their office space, you know, just to ensure proper social distancing in, in future. So True. Yeah, but also the the convention yeah. centres, you know, the big convention halls turn into giant offices, you know, until yeah, exactly. we were allowed to meet in them. Um, right, uh, Sheila, we, we, uh, before we go into kind of general chat, I'm going to give you David Wood's question, because uh, I think this ties into some of what you wrote in the book and some of what you touched on over the last hour and a half. Um, how do we develop greater political transparency, e.g. encouraging whistleblowers, without our information systems becoming overwhelmed by clever fake news distortions, <laughs> e.g. clamping down on conspiracy mongers. That's easy. Thank you, da Thank you David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're banned. Good luck. <laughs> um, I, think, I think a lot of whistleblowing is, is often requires a huge amount of courage if it's, if it's genuine. Um, and so I think one of the things is actually to provide a legal framework so that people have the right to, 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 to whistleblow if, if, they, um, if they really do see something wrong. Um, 
I think um, a free press, some of the big scandals, for example, in care companies recently, um, the Winterbourne View scandal, that was actually revealed by um, traditional media people going in, posing as care workers and actually revealing the, the, the problems in, in, in that particular care home. So I think there's a legal requirement. I think there's a, um, the, the, there's a, um, a, a traditional media. And, and so again, we need to be willing to pay for our information somehow. So that's, that's going to be a conundrum as if we do shift online. How we stop a, a flood of fake news and that I, I Perhaps, perhaps the, 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 the AI will become much more sophisticated in being able to actually see whether things, you know, faces have been superimposed on things, whether events have been stitched together in a, in, and so that actually things don't quite sync and they aren't quite right. Um, but I think that whole thing of, of fake news, just as with false reviews on, on TripAdvisor or whatever, um, I, I, it's, 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 I think it's something that we are going to have to live with in a new reality, and it's a very scary one. Lisa, I'm going to bring you and Paul in very quickly on this, but I, I guess the take I would have is, can we get to a more transparent political system with the current governance models and the people in, in power? Mm. Uh, if I look around the world, you know, I see certain leaders around the world who may well have been supported by an element of fake news and whose actions feed it. Can, mm. can we get to a more transparent system with our current leaders? And I'm not talking about everyone, but there are some that are more prominent than others. Um, can we get there? Lisa? Well, we have, we have a, I would say, a fairly well-functioning democracy, but we have a multi-party system which also makes it difficult to move unless uh, you have a situation of crisis of where the prime minister is taking over the stage. Uh, I, think, I think we'll have a, a young generation entering right now who feel that they are too few to be heard and uh, who have other priorities. So we might see a, a revolt from the Greta Thunbergs and the like. Mm -hmm. Uh, who will, um, I actually had a session with uh, young kids coming from 40 different countries and they said, Lisa, we're going to make a kind of LinkedIn uh, for companies that are all uh, living up to the United Nations uh, targets. Uh, we only want to share our data with them. That's the only companies we want to work for. It's the only uh, companies that, that we will support in our shopping patterns. So they were very strict and they were between I don't know, 16 and 18 year old. Uh, so mm -hmm. they will enter the labor market soon. So what they can do when they can't vote in order to decide is that they can vote with mm -hmm. their feet and their shopping patterns and their data. And I think they're very aware of that. And they're actually able to pull their power because they can communicate online and create quite a uh, massive movement. So, so we might see some political revolt from, from other places than we're used to. Okay, given the time, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a slightly different question, Paul, and it's because you've got a beach scene behind you. Uh, Jose <laughs> Cordero, uh, who's one of the contributors to the second book, says, "What is the best route out after COVID um, for countries that live from tourism, like Spain? What's the route forward? We've seen Greece saying it's going to open up, saying uh, New Zealand saying they're going to open an air bubble between them and Australia. I mean." What's the route forward for those that live by the beach? Well, well, I, I, I think one thing we, we're going to see, and particularly those those countries for where where tourism is a major a major contributor to, to the economy, I think you will probably see some of the more innovative and uh, probably more thought through responses coming from those countries because mm. they're going to particularly want to test everyone coming into those countries. I mean, we, we were commenting uh, earlier before this started about how, you know, what, what a good job relatively that Greece, you know, has done with a population of around 9, 10 million to only have, a hundred, you know, around 100, 102 deaths so far. Yet they are a country that is desperately keen um, to open up its, uh, its beaches, you know, it's, you know, I mean, tourism, I think, is the second largest uh, industry in Greece, as it is in Spain, you know, and, and yet, you know, the Greeks are going to test every single person, you know, coming off an aeroplane to their country and, 
you know, and anyone who tests positive, I think is going to have to be quarantined or, or won't be allowed in. And I think, you know, you, you're going to see some fairly rigid and fairly tough measures from those countries, but they're going to quite rightly want to get a major, you know, income stream for their national economy back up and running as quickly um, and as effectively uh, as possible. And for them, that's going to mean taking control you know, of how they test for the virus. You know, and, and I think we'll probably end up taking our lead from some of those countries because they'll be, they'll have very, you know, vested interests in getting the solution sorted quicker. I, I do worry that some people will open up too quickly and uh, accelerate no, no, the second peak. Yeah, definitely. Look at where the tourists come from that they need the money from. Um, so I'm thinking about the UK and the US in that regard. Um, uh, let's take the next question from Stephen Troutman, who's been waiting patiently uh, for us to answer his question. Is climate change a wild card for the COVID-19 response? And how do climate events impact the scenarios? If you'd like to lead on that one. I, I wouldn't mind starting on that. I mean, and, and, and I say that only because I do a lot of my work in South Africa. And if you read a lot of the press reports uh, and the, well, the medical report, uh, the thoughts from the you know, people in authority, down there, you know, with the with the virus actually increasing in, uh, in in the cold of the climate, you know, the southern hemisphere is now heading into their winter, you know, and they're actually forecasting that in places like South Africa, the peak of the epidemic may not occur until late July or early August, you know. So I think we have to be very very careful because people flying backwards and forwards between north, northern and southern hemispheres, you know, are going to be one group of people you're probably going to look at very closely you know, over the coming two or three months, just in case, you know, as you rightly say, you know, some, some markets almost certainly open up too quickly. And before we know it, we could be back on with another huge spike in cases. Cool. Uh, Sheila, Lisa. Any um, I, I, <clears throat> I don't think so much it's a, a wild card. I think, I mean, the, 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 the danger is that, that people will not see it as an opportunity as we come out of the, uh, out of the lockdown. I mean, the, the, the cover this week on, on The Economist, which I haven't read properly yet, um, is, is addressing just this issue that, that we have a fantastic opportunity to grasp the nettle of climate change um, and that we've shown, governments have shown that they're willing to act at, in, in, in tandem and, and put through measures. Um, oh, am I, am, I, am I? Oh, no, that's all right. Um, and that that it now is a very good opportunity i think to 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 do that and use the the the, the bottom of the of the uh, the the recession that we're now in um to build up with with doing things differently and if companies have got money from the government they should be required to change their ways in some way that the, the, the banks were not required to change their ways sufficiently in return for the billions that they got um, but I think this time round, hopefully, if you've got a lot of money, whether you've got furloughed staff or, or, or direct loans or rent, you know, or holidays of other kinds, then you've got to do something in terms of, of actually addressing cleaner air, better ways of doing things and um, addressing climate change. Lisa. Any... Rolls Royce. Yeah, Patrick, I think. I think... To learn that. Sorry, Sheila. Sorry, Lisa Lotta. Thanks. And uh, I completely agree with uh, Sheila's points as well in her presentation. And uh, in terms of the climate, I think that we will have uh, some help coming from, from this economic situation. We can't go in the luxury climate change, but we can do it in that we decentralized with our power energy. This from, from uh, just in time to just in case, we might start having more uh, lab grown meat rather than cows on the field. We'll have uh, vertical gardens. So I think we have a lot of new technologies coming into play. And then what is going to happen to the nature and biodiversity once we get our, these technologies at our disposal is a big question. And I like Sheila's point that if we start moving out of the cities, if we will have these uh, self-sustainable uh, climate-friendly clusters, because uh, if we start creating all these things by ourselves, well, uh, we can put the principles of living fairly high in terms of being uh, uh, more sustainable. Uh, and also the, the big cities uh, have the chance to, to rethink 
in how they're going to use their new spaces once mobility yeah. starts to change. So we are moving into these next 10 years, which is going to be a huge transformation. Mm -hmm. I do not think we will go back to the traditional yeah. uh, industrial uh, mindset we will have uh, well-being budgets and we will look at the climate and it's not going to change in the interest yeah. of time i'm going to move us on but what one thing i would just say on that is that um i, I think what will be interesting is that with a decline in in the use of personal transport and the decline in aviation over the next few years the spotlight is going to shift to some other industries and farming mm -hmm. i think is going to get a lot more attention because of the yeah. scale of emissions and the other is power generation and, and you know all the other sectors that have sort of got away hiding behind exactly aviation, exactly but actually they're far bigger emitters uh and and you know i think citizens will be able to exercise a lot more influence on them you know yeah. when you start to buy green energy right i'm gonna i think can i just say one very yeah, quick thing and i think one of the things we'll see is perhaps building regulations requiring large buildings supermarkets warehouses or whatever to have green roofs and solar power and much better insulation. I think building regulations in terms of any new build and retrofit could go a long way to, to addressing some of those problems as well. Good point. Right, so let's, let's take this question from David Burns, who deserves an answer because he stayed up very late into the night in Dubai. Um, what if the vaccine is not, is, is not administered in the old fashioned way, but by aerosol or tablet, which would, which would be much quicker? Anyone got a view on what that would do? I'd say it would be fantastic, but I have no idea I, if it's possible. I, I wouldn't have thought, I don't know if it's possible, but if it were, I think it would be, it would be fantastic. But would we have to, if, if we're taking it by tablet or aerosol and, and therefore it doesn't go actually into the body, but goes into the digestive system, it might, it might have to be a, a daily dose. I don't know. I, I've, I've no idea, but a, a different way of delivery would be, would be brilliant. Like malaria tablets, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now well, we certainly have... better than drinking Domesto. No, I won't <laughs> have it. I won't have it. Uh, and apparently, you know, hydrochloroquine. <laughs> it's not, oh yeah. You know, a hundred percent. Let's not go there. In all the research that says it kills you. Um, uh, from Juan Carlos Mora Montero, uh, do you think that every country must build their own scenarios? I kind of think yes. And probably. I yes. think so too. I yeah. think it's really important that you take your national areas of businesses mm. and special issues in the population and, and uh, you have to build those into the scenarios for sure. Yeah, I, I think yes also. And, and but as I said earlier, I think you've got to also take best practice from where best practice is being deployed. Mm. And I think the example of, of, of South Africa is it emerged from from apartheid era where the scenarios were used to create a, a, a national discussion and a really positive and shared way forward I think is a, is a fantastic example and it, it, it's very relevant I think for, for, for today. Yeah well said. Uh, Court Robertson asks isn't Singapore a good example? This was probably a really meaningful at the point where we were talking about whatever it was but I'm not um, a good example of what, yes, I think it's a very good example of. I think uh, it's a very good uh, example of coping with, uh, with the pandemic in terms of, of, of using these data points to find out how people are and how they're thriving. So yeah, but Singapore, Singapore, as a, it's a high tech country. I think they, they're doing a great job. Yeah, Hong Kong as well. Yeah, well, Hong Kong. Like they're they're also, they've, they've also gone very, very heavily down wonderful um, eco structures and the use of vertical gardens, green walls, um, technology to clean pollution using materials in in you know in walls and things. So I think in in that sense, yes. Um, and and again, you know, they they do they they plan. You know, they look ahead at what do we need to do and how we're going to get there. So in they take very much a, a, a foresight perspective on 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 where they're going as well. And I like the robot dog walking around in the park. Yeah. Making sure you stay one oh, meter yes. apart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's very I high tech. That. that was great. Uh, let's take two last questions and then uh, we're going to wrap up. Um, Stephen Troutman asks, which scenario deals with major economic collapse resulting in economic refugees going on the move, similar to North Africa and Syria's to, Syrians to Europe? Uh, I can tell you from the construction of them, we put them in the two, um, in the worst case scenario, we saw that there being a new refugee crisis mm -hmm. for that. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. 
but I think you're going to see that. And then uh, David Wood gets the honour of having the last question. Uh, reflecting on the results of the latest poll, what actions could significantly accelerate demand for a green recovery deal? 30 seconds each, go. How do we accelerate? What would drive a green recovery deal? Let's start with you, Lisa. We'll end with you, Sheila. We'll take Paul in the middle. Well, I want to go back to the start with this exponential change, understanding that uh, learning from this pandemic, also understanding that goes for the environment. So if we don't act in time, basically we don't have a planet to be here. And, and there we need simulations. We need some great scenarios that depict exactly that. And if it's uh, in order to point the fingers at Rohit's scenarios, Rohit, you could go back and put some more environment into those scenarios. There is, yeah, there's room. We're trying to stick to a word limit. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I, I, I would echo what Lisa's just said. And, and you know, I think, you know, I keep coming back to this term about sharing best practice and good news. You know, I, I, I think, you know, climate change has been a time, a ticking time bomb for a long time. And I think, you know, you know, COVID is, is you know, maybe diverted attention away from it, but I think it's going to come back, you know, and I think the lessons we, we, we take to cure the current pandemic, I think many of them, the principles behind them will also work, you know, to, to, you know as we start to tackle climate change for the longer term. Excellent. Sheila. I think one, one of the things is, is making people realise that we ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, if we thought that the pandemic was bad, um, wait till we get, we, you know, we get the, 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 the high levels of, uh, of climate change because, you know, we've, we've had biblical um, sort of crises of biblical proportions because we've had fire, famine, um, flood, uh, huge storms pestilence with locusts and now a, a pandemic so you know it, it, the world is telling us the system is telling us something it's about time we learn to listen but I think Lisa Lotta's uh, example of of those young people saying we're just not going to do it if you don't do do what's right we're not going to shop with you and I think the power of consumers um, is potentially and, and the young consumers if they if they do take action I think could be fantastic. I'd agree. I'd say um, the, the thing we did talk about a lot in the scenarios was the idea of tying, tying the bailout packages to Green New Deal. Yeah. But I think it's got to be real green investment, not greenwashing by corporates. Yeah. And also, yeah. I think tying the new skills agenda to creating the skills for people to work in vertical farming, you know, and any of the other, you know, solar, any, any of the kind of alternative technologies new environmental cleanup technologies but really creating both the demand from a encouraging investment point of view but also the supply in terms yeah. of creating the skills so we have two minutes left to finish the session so i'm just going to literally uh firstly thank my panelists for being so brilliant and having so many excellent ideas uh and so much to say about so many topics it's been fantastic and then i'm just going to quickly talk you through uh for those of you who haven't seen the book yet or seen the details. Um, so you've been hearing some of the, the, the ideas in the initial chapters. The, the first section, as I say, deals with critical shift and scenarios. Uh, and so alongside the, the chapters you've heard from, we've got really interesting chapters. Sahail, who many of you know, has written about six different um, ways, narrative ways of looking at the crisis and that, the way out of it. Uh, Miranda Mante, someone wasn't known to us before, a foresight researcher from the US, has talked about some of the most interesting strategies that are emerging for dealing with the contagion. Um, you've heard a couple of others. Uh, Jerry from the States, Jerry Edling, really interesting chapter about what could we learn from the way we're collaborating in healthcare to rethink medicine. And then Bruce Lloyd, um, Professor of Strategic Management, South Bank University, has talked about this idea of a new Marshall Plan for the planet and what might that look mm -hmm. like. Then there's a section on social policy. Somebody asked about a return to roots. Neil Watson, who's an AI ethicist, talks about what if this takes us back. Uh, people from the Australian New Zealand Police Authority are talking about what can we learn from this about the new ways of policing going forward. Morgan Kaufman written a really interesting scenario saying what if we ended up having to do a drill for one month every two years to prepare for the next pandemic. And then Julia Paulette Hollenbury, a therapist from the UK, has talked about is this the moment to start learning to uh, live from our hearts and our bodies as an operating system, not just our mind. Also in that section, Sylvia from uh, the US, a futurist has talked about 
the idea of the, the Zuma generation who were born out of, you know, being locked down in the planet, uh, in the crisis. Uh, how do you talk to them in the future and what, what does their world look like? Joe Tankersley writes a really interesting scenario on what happens if we declare victory too early. And Alex, our foresight director, has written a really uh, fascinating chapter about the, the changes in our homes and how we would fund those so that they were available to everyone for the future. Then we have a section on government and, government, uh, and economy. We, that picture. <laughs> uh, we talk about what could uh, governments learn from futurists who talk about this stuff all the time. David Wood goes much more deep into that, into how do we make sure that we're better prepared for the future and more agile. Uh, Jeff Mulgan, uh, professor of computation intelligence, uh, uh, sorry, collective intelligence from University College London, looks at some of the lessons we're learning from the way the best governments have responded and how do we scale that up going forward. Bronwyn Williams, an economist and futurist from South Africa, talks about the potential for greater separation in society and between nations. Lee Shook, a uh, well-known futurist from the US, talks about four different scenarios for the US, depending on how the crisis plays out in the economy and the election. And then we talk about five critical things that we think need to happen in the new economic agenda. And then the final section, um, Tom Cheese, right, UK futurist, talks about this idea of what if, what if we don't have the expected boom in, in remote working. Alida Drought, a futurist from the US, talks about how do we transform businesses to be more human. Uh, Robert Caldera talks about what would happen if all those changes that were already underway got accelerated by the pandemic and what does the new future of work look like as a result. And then Robert Roberto Saraco uh, has written a really interesting piece about the role digital twins could play in our lives. We close them with a little piece about what are we learning about the way we lead organizations and how might that change and then uh, drawing across all the chapters in the book we try and pull out what we think are kind of 10 key messages about the change agenda so well worth buying uh, bargain at a price um, lots of events coming up every Sunday night we're going to have four of the panelists coming and sharing in the same way as you've seen our excellent colleagues do tonight June the 1st is the day we're having a 12-hour marathon with 22 of the the presenters from the book the authors are going to share we'll, we'll do something similar they'll talk for 10 minutes and in pairs and then we'll have a little chat with them and then we'll have breaks so you can go off it's free so it's gonna be brilliant um so take pictures come to that and then finally um if the message wasn't clear buy the book it's brilliant i think so and i've read it about nine times now um so thank you all for coming uh it's been brilliant and um we'll leave the um the thing open now if you want to leave any kind of final comments if I could ask the panelists just to hang on for a couple of minutes, but um, we'll stop the share and uh, we'll just uh, stop the recording and then um, you can leave any final comments if you want.